Two months ago, CBS 8 launched its first ever book club, showcasing local authors and stories from around our county. Our team chose City on Fire by Don Winslow to kick it off. It's the story of two dueling mobs, the Irish and Italians, fighting for control in a small Rhode Island town, often going to great lengths for power. It's a book the New York Times calls epic, ambitious, majestic, the godfather for our generation. Join us live in studio for our first book date with a New York Times bestselling author, and Julian resident Don Winslow. Don, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. We are so happy to have you here with us. We've been on Facebook, a little Facebook group, yeah. discussing the book, and we've given people around the county time to kind of digest it. And we want to start off with people at home who are maybe thinking, haven't started it or finished it, and you can give them a brief synopsis of, of the plot line. Yeah, it's, uh, it's about a guy named Danny Ryan. We meet him when he's a longshoreman in Providence, Rhode Island. Right. Uh, he marries into the Irish mob family, and that drags him into a mob war. And how, I mean, this is a complex story. How did you come up with the idea behind it? <laughs> A number of years ago, I realized how ignorant I was. <laughs> a lot of people had realized that much earlier, by the way, Evan. Uh, but I started to finally read the classics. And I read, of course, the Iliad. Right. And it reminded me so much not only of my beloved crime fiction genre, but also of crime history. Right. Because they were in the New England crime wars around which I grew up, uh, started in an argument over a woman on a beach which is the way this book starts, which is the way, of course, the Iliad started. So I wondered, could I retell the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, these great classics in a fully contemporary crime novel in which you didn't have to have any reference to the classics at all? Uh, if people are paying close enough attention, though, they'll notice a lot of the parallels in it, though, right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that, so. that was kind of yeah. the emphasis. Was it difficult to bring a story that's not set in Greek mythology or any mythology to present day? Yeah. It was. <laughs> like, Absolutely. It was. Uh, you know, this is the first book in a trilogy, and the trilogy took me about 30 years to write. You know, I was doing other things, of mm -hmm. course, in the meantime, and writing a lot of other books. But it took 30 years to really figure out, how do I make these people fully modern, fully human? How do I make the situations fully modern? At the same time, honoring the characters and the stories and the themes from ancient literature. So for our first book club pick, we picked City on Fire, but there are two other books. A lot of viewers at home have already said that they're interested in reading or have in some cases already read. Mm -hmm. And so you have plenty of other books beyond this trilogy. You've been writing for how long? My first book came out in 1991. Okay. But I've been writing since I was six years old. Wow. Which you can probably tell was <laughs> a while ago. Uh, yeah, and um, the second book, by the way, is largely set in San Diego. That's right, because yeah. you give a couple mentions to yeah, that in the first book. Yeah, I kind of And there it. were some points where I was like, I'm curious if that's where the second book takes us. Yeah. Um, and that's not specifically the reason why we picked this one for the book club. We did so because you're a Julian resident. Appreciate so it. So tell us about, I mean, being a San Diego native, and or at least living in San Diego. Yeah. You didn't grow up in San Diego, I did right? not. I grew up in Rhode Island, uh -huh. uh, on the, the beach set, where right? the book is set, <laughs> right on that beach where the book begins. Uh, we came out here, I was working as a, a private investigator and a trial consultant, Wow! which started to bring me out here in the, the late 80s. Okay. Um, and then uh, one night my, my wife said to me that the thought of going back to the East Coast makes me physically ill. Right. Um, and I said, good, let's not do it. And uh, we ended up uh, settling out here where we live, you know, pretty much half the year here now. That was kind of like Terry's thought about California, yeah. leaving Rhode Island, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> um, so we've been in Julian for coming on 27 years. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Well, we're happy to have you here with us. Thank you. That is the non-spoiler version, but we have much more where we're going to kind of dive a little bit more into the story. So we're going to be bringing in a panel of readers in the book club for a deeper dive into City on Fire, including our friends from Warwick's. We have a quick break. We'll be right back after this.
Welcome back, everyone. We are about to get all of our questions and your questions answered. We are joined by Cameron Duncan, producer and co-founder of Book Date with Eight. We also have Julie Slavinsky, director of events at Warwick's in La Jolla. Thank you two for joining us on the panel. And then, of course, if you were with us for the last segment, Don Winslow, author of the trilogy, the Danny Ryan trilogy, but also of City on Fire, specifically the first book club pick for Book Date with Eight. So uh, I want to kick it off with just a little bit of a quote, because this is one that I really enjoyed from the book, where you were kind of setting the stage of how these two rival mobs came to power. And you said, it was true what had made them poor, mm. small houses crowded with hungry mouths had made them rich. What had ostensi ostensibly made them weak had made them powerful. So tell us about these two rival groups and yeah. how you kind of decided to come up with their characters. It's the story of immigration in America, mm -hmm. specifically on the East Coast. You know, the, the Irish were one of the first groups to arrive, and there were signs on shops, no dogs or Irish allowed, right? right? Uh, they had to fight for a place. They went off and fought in the Civil War, and they came back and thought, you know, we deserve a, a place here. And they found it mostly in the police departments and the fire departments, but also in organized crime. Uh, 30 or 40 years later, there was a wave of Italian immigration. Same kind of thing. They were looked down upon. They were discriminated against. They had to fight to, to, uh, for a place to put their feet. And it brought them at various times into conflict with the Irish who are now established, mm -hmm. and sometimes in cooperation with the Irish against the old New England Puritan wasps. You know, so these two immigrant groups trying to find a place on the, the stony east coast of the United States. Were you at all tempted to, I also think it's interesting that it's set in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. which it's, it's sleepier than Boston and New York, at least, considering maybe not the, the gang activity, but in, in what we all know of as these cities. So they're mm -hmm. kind of in talk still with the Boston gangs mm -hmm. and the New York gangs. Mm -hmm. Why Rhode Island? Well, I grew up there. Yeah, so the... So I knew it, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> I, there was no research except consulting my memory. Right. I grew up in the era of the New England mob wars. You know, where you get up in the morning and you'd pick up the Providence Journal, the local paper, and, and there'd be pictures of bodies, you know, from a, a recent hit. You could follow it almost the way you would follow baseball. Which you kind of yeah. do in the book. You mention that yeah. the press is going to eat this up at right. times. Right, right. Yeah. You know, and I, I talk with a lot of these old, you know, grizzled crime reporters <laughs> who, who had covered those days. You know, had great dinners and lunches with them at mob spots. Right. You know, where we talked quietly, <laughs> you know? <laughs> there are still places there uh, where you don't make certain jokes, mm -hmm. you know? I bet. In, in, in certain bars and certain restaurants. So I picked Rhode Island because I knew it well, mm -hmm. because I could drive to or walk to the locations, and because it made sense for the story. I, I wanted a small town as opposed to a New York or an right. L.A because it was important that all the characters knew each other. Right. Right, they had family relationships, they were friends before the war started, which to me made for a much richer story. Yeah, I wanted to ask a little bit about Danny Ryan. He's a really interesting protagonist to me because, you know, he's kind of lost at first. He's not naturally a leader. Mm -hmm. He tries to leave, become a fisherman. Um, He's not like his best friend, Pat, you know, like who's made to be the mob leader. So what made you want to tell his story as lead? And I know he's based yeah. roughly off Aeneas yes. from the Iliad, who's not a main character at Correct. all. So I just thought that was a very interesting decision. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's exactly why. Mm -hmm. It would have been easier to tell the story from the point of view of Patrick, mm -hmm. right? Or someone who was at the center, mm -hmm. as he is in the, in the Iliad. More interesting to me, though, was to take a guy who had one foot in and one foot out, mm -hmm. because you get them both. I'm kind of greedy as a writer, right? <laughs> I'm that guy, I want my literary cake and I want to eat it, okay? So with Danny, you had a guy who was right in the center of the action, and yet mentally and emotionally, he's a little bit to the outside, so he can comment on it. Mm -hmm. He can give that kind of outsider's perspective, as well as being involved directly in the action. Yeah, which is very interesting because we even see at moments he's uh, approached by the FBI and debates 
giving people up to get his family out for safety, but yeah. he ultimately decides to stay. Yeah, so. yeah. you know, I think in, in terms of classical literature, if mm -hmm. you're going to talk about a hero, you have to have a fatal flaw, <laughs> right? Yeah. The Achilles heel, mm -hmm. that hero has to have a fatal flaw. Mm -hmm. um, Danny's is loyalty. Yes. Right. Right, that he, you know, it, it, what's more interesting though than just loyalty? Do do I stay loyal to this or do I not? To mm -hmm. me, are conflicting loyalties. Right, mm -hmm. right. Who because, am I going to be loyal right. to? Right. I mean, it, it feels yeah. like the whole time you're watching him kind of toe the line, especially once he finds out that Terry's pregnant. Mm -hmm. Of like, am right. I going to follow my family? Yeah. Or well, which side of my family am I right. going to follow? Was mm -hmm. I even ever a part of this? mob family right. or do I take my wife and my child? Yeah, he's the son-in-law. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and kind of dismissed as such and, and, and sort of belittled until, not to spoil too much, people start dying mm -hmm. and they need him but he is very conflicted. Am I loyal to that family? Am I loyal to my wife and baby? Mm -hmm. And by the way, his wife is very loyal to her family, mm -hmm. you know, right. basically saying you're not going to betray them. Mm -hmm. We don't do that here. And, and, you know, by the way, I mean, that was the atmosphere in which I grew up, you know, where loyalty was considered the prime virtue. Mm -hmm. In any family, right? In Just any like, family. Exactly. But, mm -hmm. but in that era, in that place, you, you know, there were tribal loyalties, mm -hmm. you know, that right. you, you did not violate. Mm -hmm. Right, when you get back to the ethnic, grow, growing up yeah. in those neighborhoods, yeah. it was very much that. So when you were telling the story, when we were thinking about writing this, mm -hmm. and when you were coming up with the idea of the, based on the, the classics that you did, did you think you could finish it in one story, or was it always mm -hmm. going to be a trilogy when it you started it out? Thanks. It was always going to be a trilogy. Okay. I knew that from the get-go. Unlike the sort of big fat drug books that I did, which are accidental trilogies. Okay. Because okay. I quit <laughs> after each one. So that you was did. A, oh yeah. <laughs> I, I was remember. never. Oh, right, right. We talked about that. <laughs> yeah. I'm never going back to that never world. Never going back to that. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and you went back <laughs> twice. Yeah. Uh, no, this was planned from the start because Aeneas's life came in three very distinct phases. He fights in a war, and I won't tell you how that ends, <laughs> but then he's a refugee. Mm -hmm. He has these wandering years, right, uh, and a tragic love affair. And then the, the third part of his life, very distinctly, was building an empire. Mm -hmm. So I always had that arc. Okay. I always knew three parts of his life, three parts of Danny's life. Mm -hmm. The problem, Julie, was trying to figure out the modern equivalents. Okay. Okay, yeah. you know, it, he builds an empire. What kind of empire? Mm -hmm. You can't build Rome. But then I thought, yeah, actually you can mm -hmm. in Las Vegas. Right. Right? If you have enough cash, you build anything you want, <laughs> right. right? Any fantasy, mm -hmm. Paris, Rome, Venice, pirate ship, whatever, <laughs> whatever it happens to be. You know, so no, I, I always knew that this story fell into three three acts. Which leads me to the next part because it kind of segues into it a little bit. Let's talk about, did you know your titles for these? Oh, yeah. yeah. City of Fire, City of Dream, and what do they mean to each segment of that? Yeah. Uh, no, I did not know the titles until quite late in the process, mm -hmm. until I, I stepped back from it a little bit and looked and I realized that there really are about three cities. Mm -hmm. Right? There's Rhode Island, and there's, well, first San Diego, but then Los Angeles, Hollywood, mm -hmm. specifically, mm -hmm. and then Las Vegas. Uh, and, and that seemed to work for the trilogy. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So you came up, so the titles, did they, I mean, do they mean something in each of your... Well, they do, and I'm not sure, discussing the first book, I, I want to say what, <laughs> you know? Uh, clearly, I mean, in the first book, City on Fire is mm -hmm. about a city that erupts into this gang war. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? Right. Um, like, like Troy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Right. In the Iliad. Uh, City of Dreams, well, that's Hollywood. Yeah. Right? You know, that's where we go to dream and create our dreams and, mm -hmm. and create what we think America looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. City in Ruins, I'm not going to talk about. Right? <laughs> I got that right. Why that is. <laughs> I want to take you to another character, Pasco, okay. who oh, yeah. kind of runs a little bit in the background of everything that's going on mm -hmm. with these gangs. It feels like, and Cam and I had discussed this, it feels like Pasco is viewed as this kind of wise, um, you know, uh, loyal, 
understanding person who who doesn't seem to make these rash decisions that mm -hmm. some of the other younger guys do. Right. But also earlier on in the book, you talk about Cassie, and you mention what happens between Pasco and Cassie. Yeah. And you say, when her mother asked her why and her father screamed at her and called her a junkie and a disgrace, she held her tongue and never told her, told because she was afraid that they wouldn't believe her and more afraid that they would. She never wanted to be touched by a man again and never was. Mm -hmm. So you introduce this character, Pasco, and at this point early on in the book, you don't really know how to read him. Sure. But then throughout the rest of it, it feels like we're kind of on his side for a lot of the decision making. So was what was your intent with, with Pasco's character? Yeah, uh, Pasco is the god Apollo. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it, it, it was troubles, it was difficult, but really fun in these books because yeah. there are several characters who are not human. They are gods, mm. but I had to make them human. Danny's mother, mm -hmm. Madeline, mm -hmm. is the goddess Aphrodite. Mm -hmm. right. How do you do that? But to get back to your question, sorry. Um, he's the god Apollo, and if, if you look at mythology, and if you look at Cassandra, whose name I barely changed, <laughs> the, the doomed prophetess of Troy, mm -hmm. right? She receives the gift of prophecy from Apollo as an apology for molesting her. Okay. So the god Apollo, frankly, raped mm -hmm. Cassandra right. a, as a young, as a child. Mm -hmm. uh, and in exchange, okay, he gave her the gift of prophecy. Cassie in this book, in, in a couple of these books, is constantly warning people. Mm -hmm. She sees the future. She's, she's now sober. She's, she's sober. Clear minded. Clear minded. And she says to Danny on several occasions, don't do that. This is a mistake. Please don't do that. This is the, the gift and simultaneously the curse that she has. The Pasco character, um, again, being Apollo, but you know, in his modern equivalent, I based him on a lot of guys that I mm -hmm. knew. Yeah. I grew up around those old guys, mm -hmm. you know? They were the guys who gave you dimes to buy comic books, who gave you quarters, you know, to, to go to get ice cream. They were, they were always around, you know, and they were, they were highly respected and highly regarded and to a certain extent feared. Right. You know, I mean, when I was a little kid growing up in a neighborhood just outside of Providence, there were always these like 18, 19, 20 year olds who were on the corners. And if there was a problem, right? Like the mm -hmm. classic guy who comes in, candy anyone, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, candy little boy. You told one of those guys on the corner and the problem went away. Yeah. Mm. Right? Those guys reported to somebody else who reported to the Poscos of the world. Mm -hmm. Almost like the altar boys. The altar mm -hmm. boys, definitely, in, in an Irish sense. Right. Posco would have nothing to do with two Irish punks who were out of control like the altar boys, mm -hmm. right? They, they were not invited to the parties. Right. They mm -hmm. cannot, you know, they're, they're kind of dirt. Uh, but, but the young Italian men, certainly. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Terry. She's one of my favorite characters, and she has such a tragic, heartbreaking story. Yes. You know, all she wants is a family. She finally has a child, and then she gets cancer, and mm -hmm. finally dies in the end. How do you think that death affected Danny and was almost necessary to his story? Again, it was necessary because when um, Aeneas flees mm. Troy, he loses sight of Croesus, his, mm. his beloved wife, and never sees her again. Mm -hmm. Now, again, we had to find a modern equivalent of that. Mm -hmm. You know, Listen, it broke Danny's heart. The yeah, moment you know. where, because he leaves her and she's still she's alive. alive, and then in the book you like, he says he feels that she has passed and she has yeah. gone, but he ultimately feels it's the right choice for his family. It's very moving and oh, heartbreaking. Okay. Well, even you feel you like did. you know Terry. Like, yeah. I know a million people like Terry. I'm yeah. from the East Coast, You're from, from the Philly. Northeast. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I'm like, Terry's like all my aunts. You sure, know? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I, I, I knew dozens of them. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't mean that in any dismissive sense. No, in a great way. In a great way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was it was a sad thing to write, mm -hmm. you know, but a necessary thing to mm -hmm. write, to, you know, to, so that Danny could launch onto this next phase. Mm -hmm. um, Danny's luck is certainly not in love. Yeah. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? It, you know, he has you know, several heartbreaking yeah. 
uh, kind of relationships. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt in my mind, however, that if she had, if Terry had lived, she would still be with Danny. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, no doubt in my mind at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we have other book questions related or because I was going to go into a different. I think we should. And then okay. right after that, we'll also talk about what's going to be coming up. Okay. Sounds so good. Go ahead. Okay. So you've talked about um, what it's right of you to write these books. But I want to know from Don Winslow. Uh oh. Uh oh. Here we go. <laughs> if there was a book either from your childhood or as an adult that would define who you are mm. as Don Winslow, mm -hmm. is there a book that is. Mm. <laughs> I think there were a bunch of books. You know, I think you and I maybe have talked about this before. You know, my, my dad was a, a sailor mm -hmm. who loved books. My mom, a librarian who loved a sailor. <laughs> <laughs> right? right. Uh, and so there were always books around our house, mm -hmm. and uh, we were allowed to read anything we wanted to read at, at any age. You know, I don't think I read fiction until I was. 13 or 14 oh, years old. I was totally focused on history books. There, there mm. was a series of books called the Landmark You Were There books. And it was always a little boy and a little girl, and they were there somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, the Battle of Gettysburg, okay. the invasion yeah, yeah, of Normandy, yeah, yeah. the Johnstown flood. These two kids were there, yeah. right? And I was there with them. I mean, I loved those books. Later on, you know, my, my dad turned me on to Mishner, for instance. Mm. Um, and I was very taken by Mishner's autobiographical novel, The Fires of Spring, mm. um, that includes you know, the story of a young man who runs away with the carnival. I didn't run away to the carnival, but I ran away to the theater, mm. literally. Yeah. You know, um, ran away from home, and there was a, a theater, a uh, summer stock theater a mile away, and I was walking past it, and they were auditioning. People. This is getting far away from the <laughs> no, because Well, people want to know who Don, who yeah. uh, I mean, we've written these, all these books. This is yeah. a nice glimpse. And, and it was know. raining, right? And they were serving coffee and donuts. And so I thought, ah, oh, I can get out of the rain mm -hmm. long enough to figure out what to do, right? I think I was 13. And I um, ended up getting the part in a play called A Thousand Clowns. I played the kid. And they, they asked me, where's your agent? And <laughs> I didn't know what they meant. <laughs> the only agent that I knew was like from, you know, the, the secret agents, yeah. James Bond and, <laughs> you know, yeah. and that kind of stuff. And I said, well, and they said, where are your parents? And I said, well, <laughs> that's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> I know where they are. The opposite is not the case. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know, they, they called my parents and I, <laughs> I, just, I, you know, ran away to the theater. So that, you know, Mishner was a big influence on me, uh, a writer named Leon Uris. Uh, back when I was a kid. And then Dickens. When, um, when I was working in this theater, you know, the adults got up to all kinds of stuff, right? And they literally would lock me in the dressing room. And one of the actors tossed in a copy of Oliver Twist. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll never forget it. And he said, here, educate yourself. <laughs> You're really stupid. And he, <laughs> he tossed in Oliver Twist. And so I would, you know, while they were out partying or doing whatever they were doing <laughs> out there, I, I was in the dressing room, you know, reading Dickens. Uh, and then went on to read David Copperfield and Great Expectations and all those things. And then Shakespeare, you know. Uh, I was that geeky kid who <laughs> would take a volume of Shakespeare and walk off into the woods and sit oh, and wow. read it, you know, hour after hour. Yeah. Yeah. Book number three is the center point for Something that's happening at Warwick's. At Warwick's. Event is on April 10th. We'll be having you back at the store. Good. For um, City and Ruins, which you'll tell us, maybe at the event, that's what it is. At the event, you'll tell us what the title is about. Okay. So come to Warwick's and tell us what the title I, I is. I will do. So April 10th, we'll be at Warwick's. But so my question to you is, and we'll, I think we might get to this a little bit, um, this is your last, this is your last book, your last, your last hurrah. Yeah. So the book event at Warwick's will be your last tour that you'll have at Warwick's. Yes. What will you miss mm. about touring? I know there's some, I know there's a lot of bad, but there's got to be some good. No, there's a lot of there's good. A lot of good. <laughs> there's a lot of good. I'll miss the bookstore people. Mm. Miss the bookstore owners you and Julie. the people who <laughs> <would they? laughs> well, No, seriously, Julie would yeah. certainly be right. in that category mm -hmm. because of been so warm and so welcoming. We've, We've had, had a lot of events. So many laughs and, you know, so many good times together that I'll definitely miss that. Right. You know, look, every material thing that I have, I owe to bookstore people 
and to readers, mm -hmm. right? And so to get out there and say thank you and meet them and answer mm -hmm. questions and do whatever, you know, that I can do to support those bookstores, I'm really happy to do. So I'll miss that camaraderie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's huge. And yeah, we'll it is. You. Yeah. We will miss you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'll come to the store. <laughs> yeah. I come up to <laughs> Julian. <laughs> yeah, you know. Exactly. Like, we're not and after the commercial, we're going to ask you specifically why that's happening and what your future is going to look like after writing books. Um, there's going to be a lot of discussion about the trilogy in general. So again, on the on Warwick's website, right? Yep. People can mm -hmm. find. They can find out how to come to. Yep. On okay. June, um, Perfect. April tenth. April tenth. Um, thank you both for joining thank our you. panel. Thank you. Thank you. This is we'll fun. Right thank you, guys. Right after a quick break, stay with us. Okay. Perfect. Welcome back, everyone. We just dove deep into City on Fire by Don Winslow, but we want to ask Don specifically what people can ask from the remaining two books in the trilogy. Like I mentioned, some viewers have already chosen to take it upon themselves and read the second, mm -hmm. and then I also want you to include in that when the third is coming out. Yeah. Uh, the third one comes out April 2nd. Okay, and, yeah. and what do the second and third entail? We talked about that a little bit earlier on, but... Yeah, if you follow more. Danny throughout his life, uh, he, he leaves Rhode Island under a cloud, to say the least. He's a fugitive for a long time, ends up in Hollywood, ends up around the movie business uh, for reasons I won't disclose. <laughs> uh, and then in the third book, uh, City in Ruins, uh, he ends up in Las Vegas. Okay, yeah. and I mean, there also is a little bit of a tie to San Diego in the second one, right? There is, there okay. is. When, when Danny flees from Rhode Island, where he ends up is San Diego, living in North Park. Ooh. Yeah, and uh, tending bar around there. So okay. there's, there's quite a bit of San Diego, actually in, in book two and three. And uh, like you said, April 2nd is when people can yes, sir. They can pre-order it now, right? Pre-order it now. Okay, perfect. In fact, I have them on me if they want, no. <laughs> well, we do, that's, Julie does. She's got, she, <laughs> she's she ready, to go. ready to go. She's got copies. Um, we have a viewer named Shelby. Mm -hmm. She was very curious about the possible movie adaptation of City on Fire, the first book. I know that there are some things you can and can't tell us, so what can you tell us about? What I can tell you is it's not possible. It's, it's heading toward okay. the films. It's, it's on, and it's starring Austin Butler. Wow. With, yeah, I'm thrilled about it, you know? It's, it's so funny because uh, my wife and I had just watched Elvis, the film, and then the next day my agent called and said, hey, I got great news. Austin Butler wants to do Danny Ryan. And I went, yeah. That'd be great. And I just finished watching Masters of the Air and I'll right. be watching Dune. And so, uh -huh. yeah, I'm very excited about it. And that was our next question. Our, one of our other viewers, John, was wondering who you had in mind for Danny when you were writing it, if it wasn't Austin Butler. Did you have any other people that you were thinking of? You know what? I never think about that. Now, I, I don't mm -hmm. want to be disingenuous. Right. Almost everything I've ever written has been optioned or purchased by film or television. Mm -hmm. So I know that there's a likelihood that's going to happen. I never imagine actors when I'm writing a okay. book. Because you want it to be its own character. Exactly. Right? Okay. Only bad things can happen. You're going to end up <laughs> you know, writing a bad film treatment and a bad novel right. in, in the same volume. But when they told me about Austin and I spoke with Austin you know, about Danny and about the book and everything, I, I was so delighted. He's a very smart guy, down-to-earth guy. He gets Danny. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. And I mean, it. his career has exploded in the yeah. last couple of years. So yeah. that's an incredible right. actor. Yeah, have. and there's no truth to the rumor though that they picked him because he looks so much like me. That, well, I, I think there's some truth behind it. So there, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I um, debunk that right now. With the end of book three. Yeah. I mean, if it is your last book, as you say it is, what are your plans after writing? I know you. There's a reason why you're leaving yeah. being an author. Yeah, yeah, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, one, you know, this trilogy took me three decades to write. So it's, it's the culmination of a career. Yeah. And so when I ended it, and it was also a bit of a homecoming in terms of going back to Rhode Island in a, in a literary sense, going home, uh, it felt like an ending. It felt like an ending. And also, I've had such a bigger and better career than I, that I ever dreamed of having. And I'm so grateful for it. And I don't want to push that. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I want to be grateful for, for what I've been given by readers uh, and say good. It feels right. It feels right. The second reason, though, you know, you don't get to choose the era in which you were born. Right. Right. 
And um, there are things happening right now in this country that I strongly object to that require a more rapid response than one can do through a novel. Mm -hmm. It requires almost a daily kind of response. I think that democracy in this country is under serious threat from the right. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be in that fight. Uh, I'm not a young guy. Uh, and so what energies and time I have, uh, I think are, are better put to, to that fight than to Don Winslow writing another right. book. Yeah. But I mean, you've got plenty that people can, if, if they haven't read your previous books, I mean, like you said, you've been writing for a long time. Yeah. You've got plenty of books that they can read. Plenty through. of and, books, And I mean, yeah. you're still going to be around, but there, it, it just won't be specifically in writing novels. Yeah, listen, I think, um, I think I'll always write. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'll always publish. Okay, interesting, okay? yeah. You know? Right. Uh, I think that, you know, I, I've been in the harness for a long time. You know, I get up at, at 5 in the morning and I'm at work at 5.30. And, yeah. you know, I stop again at 5.30 as, you know, we would say in the Midwest, I work from can't see to can't see, <laughs> you know? And so taking kind of a, a break from that, I think will be yeah, a good thing. A but I think I'll always write, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, we want to give you a huge thank you for coming to CBS 8 and oh. spending time with us. Congratulations on all of your success, like you mentioned. Thank you very much. And um, on being our first, very first oh. book date with 8 then. I'm so honored. <laughs> I am so honored to be the very first one, and I wish you every success with oh, this. We appreciate it. Yeah. And, and with that, we also want to mention what our next book club pick is, because you know, we can't leave, Dude. have viewers go without knowing. Tell. All right, so before we go, we want to announce that next book club pick. Uh, it is going to be The Darkest White by La Costa resident Eric Blem. So you're looking at it there on your screen. It is a nonfiction book. Uh, it's a story of legendary snowboarder Craig Kelly and his tragic death in 2003 following an avalanche in British Columbia. It's a, an incredible tale. So we want you to keep up to date with the latest. You can head to cbs8.com slash book club to find more details. That will also give you a link to join our Facebook page where you can ask questions that we bring here to the author. Uh, you can find out more on how to get a copy of the next book and uh, we'll also of course be meeting with Eric himself, the author of the book, in a couple of months. So uh, that's the next book club selection. But again, Don, we appreciate you joining us. An incredible book, City on Fire. And uh, good luck with the book tour you're about thanks. to embark yeah, on. Thanks, right? yeah. Thank you very much. And thanks again for having me. All right. We have uh, much, much more over on our website, cbsa.com slash book club. We appreciate you joining us in the meantime. And have a great day.